Hi, I'm John Kamenowski from the Florida Coastal Everglades Long-Term Ecological Research Program. And on behalf of uh, Evelyn Geyser, our lead PI, and all of our uh, colleagues and collaborators at the Florida Coastal Everglades, I am excited to present our site talk for the Science Council 2020 meeting. Um, we turned in our renewal proposal in spring 2020, so that's big site news. Um, and as you can see from the title slide and from the pictures in the title slide, we are a site that experiences a lot of dynamic changes and disturbances. And one of our key focal areas in FCE 4, which is you know, we're starting our 20th year of FCE, so we're leaving our teenage years behind and getting into to deeper long-term research. Um, our key focus in our, our current uh, LTR uh, research program is pulse dynamics and changing coastal ecosystems. So these coastal ecosystems in Florida are a mixture of um, they're subtropical systems, mangrove forests along our coastal fringe um, that are ex experiencing pulses of hurricanes as well as pulses of seasonal fresh water. Our, our freshwater marshes sometimes dry down, uh, sometimes unfortunately artificially due to water management, but with Everglades restoration, uh, we are experiencing fewer of these um, uh, negative effects of droughts. However, <clears throat> the, the last photo on the right shows a collapse of soil, which is a phenomenon called peat collapse, which we're experiencing throughout the Everglades uh, due to saltwater intrusion, which is exacerbated with sea level rise. So our fundamental question is how are fresh and marine hydrologic pulses interacting with other long-term changes and disturbances to influence the trajectory of coastal ecosystems? And I want to emphasize two examples of these, one from the marine side of these pulses, one from the marine side and one from the freshwater side. So storms, uh, sometimes hurricanes, other times just, just tropical depressions, are sources of marine phosphorus and carbon. So when we get pulses of storm surge that come in, as illustrated by this graphic on the left-hand side, it can increase our storm surge up to a meter. Uh, in this case, this was from Hurricane uh, Irma in 2017. Um, and that increase in storm surge delivers a lot of uh, sedimentary phosphorus from the Gulf of Mexico. And this illustration to, to the right here is showing upstream coastal mangroves along Shark River Slough, midstream, mangrove forests and more near coastal mangrove forests. So the closer to the coast, these mangroves get a larger uh, uh, dump of, of uh, sediment pulse, which increases their productivity and raises their elevation. So we see this as a positive feedback of marine pulses. In the absence of seasonal freshwater pulses, as shown here on the right hand side, we can start to lose carbon through loss of soil elevation in a couple of ways. Um, in the Everglades, we have limestone underlaying our foundation, and on top of that is peat soils. And those peat soils are very sensitive to both salinity and water changes. And in this illustration, we did a manipulation where we added um, phosphorus and seawater to freshwater marshes, and the addition of seawater changed the below ground allocation of roots, which causes an elevation change in soil very rapidly um, by 2.8 centimeters within uh, about two months of exposure at 10 parts per thousand. We are trying to understand changes in carbon processes throughout our landscape. And we are really well positioned to do this with a network of eddy flux towers which are represented here on the left-hand side by the stars along the map, both along Shark River Slough and Taylor Slough. And then we have the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, the world's largest restoration effort in scale and in finance, 
that's occurring right now. And these uh, triangles represent uh, leveraged projects that we're using to understand the influence of increasing freshwater pulses from Everglades restoration projects. Um, within our marsh sites, uh, Shark River Slough is a long hydroperiod marsh, Taylor Slough is a short hydroperiod marsh, um, and we have long-term data on the net ecosystem exchange, the ability of the system to absorb relative to releasing of carbon to the atmosphere. Um, Shark River Slough has a lot less variability in its net ecosystem exchange than Taylor Slough, and Taylor Slough gets really impacted by droughts, as evidenced by the low uh, levels there. Our mangrove forests are really different. Our riverine mangrove forests of Shark River Slough are highly, highly productive um, and store a lot of carbon, whereas our Taylor Slough mangroves are scrubby and shorter statue and are lower productivity and do not store as much carbon. So understanding those changes long-term are of interest to us. And finally, seagrass meadows within Florida Bay are an important carbon sink, but they're in a very low productivity environment. Um, they can be rapidly lost and they are um, vulnerable to salinity. Closing uh, briefly on some challenges, we are trying to decouple our particulate and dissolved sources of organic matter. Um, capturing that lateral fluxes of carbon for understanding net ecosystem carbon balance and accounting for uh, the contribution of carbonates to carbon fluxes. Um, one of our big challenges but opportunities is disturbance is not really controllable, but freshwater restoration is beginning and is um, rapidly occurring following two similar hurricanes. And the park uh, limits our ability to do experiments but landscape uh, scale experiments are beginning in our neighboring wetlands. And I want to highlight some cross-site synthesis um, uh, papers and opportunities. Um, Evelyn Geyser produced a paper that came out this year in bioscience on using the disturbance framework that involves seven to eight sites. And Aaron Hogan, a student at Lokio LTR, but also a graduate student at FIU, uh, just had a cross-site hurricane uh, frameworks paper that came out in bioscience. And I'm working on a saltwater intrusion effects on wetland carbon uh, project with 30 plus authors. Let me know if you're interested. I wanna end briefly by saying that in the future, we're using patterns of trajectories of change in, in coastal systems to understand how pulses um, of hydrology are changing with presses um, in uh, other frameworks of, of uh, change and looking for how these changes are affecting large-scale landscape patterns of vegetation as our salt water continues to increase and our freshwater pulses continue to increase throughout our landscape. Thank you.